Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lars, uh, Mark, for inviting me, for giving me this opportunity to present you our program, Biological Physics of Chromosomes, here. And as Lars mentioned, I wanted just to reiterate to the, to the chromosome people who are uh, sitting here and listening that the goal of this this talk is to give uh, an overview of uh, our program, our context of our field uh, to the KITP scientists who most of them are probably not in the physics of genome. So uh, I will try to give such overview. This is by no means comprehensive. So again, for the chromosome people, if they feel I have omitted uh, their specific uh, uh, focus in the field, uh, please uh, forgive me. So let me start. So I will share here. So I'm here now on two devices and I'm going to here technologically to break Zoom if possible. Let's see. So I have disconnected. I have to reconnect. So I have figured out a way to emulate Blackboard since this is supposed to be a blackboard talk. Um, it is, of course, uh, very weird on uh, many levels since I do not have a physical blackboard uh, in front of me, yet I will try here to write and uh, explain as I go. At the same time, I also don't see all of you guys um, as my living audience, so I do not have uh, visual cues and feedback. So please ask questions at any point you need me to clarify something or have questions. All right, so let's start. So as I uh, named this talk, this lecture, uh, the other nuclear physics, it has a reason because most of you um, at KITP, you have, you have heard about the other nuclear physics uh, quite a bit. And that one deals with this type of nucleus that we all, uh, as physicists, know very, very closely in great detail. The nucleus that our program focuses on is, however, quite a different one. That would be a cell. And here, this is the nucleus inside of the cell that stores the genetic material. So I would argue that these two building units that I have here drawn here, you have an atom versus a cell, are both uh, extremely important. One as a building block of all the matter and the other one as the building block of, of us uh, uh, living organisms. And without that, uh, we would not be there. Uh, here at all. So I will show you before before I kind of uh, start the historical perspective and the, the direction of our program, let me first give you a brief overview. So we are a five week program running from June 15 till July 17th. Unfortunately, virtually um, this year, but uh, we very much hope that sometimes in the future we will get a chance also to relive uh, this program in person. I uh, am co-organizing this program together with uh, Shura Grossberg and Ralph Evers. And so the three of us have put uh, here together this, uh, this program focusing on, on the physics of what we call here chromosomes but maybe more generally we should even call it genome. So first, um, let, me, let me first put us all on a common den denominator. Um, what, what is it that I'm talking about? So every cell, so what you are seeing here on this picture, I'm using some pictures as uh, these are very difficult to redraw, even though I'm using iPad as chalkboard and trying to write. So what you see here, th this would be here, for example, a single cell, you see, so the, here are two guys uh, neighboring each other, and inside here you see a cell nucleus. Within that nucleus you have a genetic material that is stored there in form of this DNA molecule. Now, why do we care? Why is it so extremely interesting for physicists? Think about it. As humans, we have, uh, overall, we have about two meters of DNA, of linear D DNA um, contour length, so in inside of one single cell. Now, this nucleus that I was drawing here is actually only, only 10 micrometers large. 
So how do you pack actually two meters of this uh, enormously long polymer inside of such a small contraption, in such a site of such small confinement is really a uh, great question. Moreover, you have to consider that this the molecule is a source of all information in the cell, meaning it needs to be used, it needs to be read out, right? So how, um, how does it work? There are processes, right, as a gene, uh, gene expression, uh, transcription, so on. A DNA uh, gets damaged in various processes, it needs to be repaired. So there needs to be access by various machineries from various biological processes that need to access that molecule. Therefore, it's even more critical in what way and how you now pack this two meters in such a way that it makes sense, that it is easily accessible and can be used uh, for anything necessary in such time that you as organism survive. So this is something that um, physicists have been curious already for for a very long time. So I wanted to here mention um, one of uh, the very first uh, kind of lectures on this topic that in 1943, Erwin Schrodinger gave, uh, which then later came up summarized in that little beautiful book, What is Life, that I'm sure many of you know, where he was already wondering, uh, what are or like how can we describe everything what's going on in a living organism um, by laws of physics and by chemistry? How can we do that? He even here uh, uh, has this beautiful statement in in his book that I that I like to I like to cite here. You see here living matter, while not eluding the laws of physics as established up to date, is likely to involve others' laws of physics hitherto unknown, which, however, once they have been revealed, will form just as integral a part of science as the former. So the fact that we don't understand uh, the physical laws underlying these living processes uh, does not mean they don't follow uh, physics, only that we are yet still learning them. So actually, already Schrodinger actually was, was um, thinking um, in, um, in this book here about how the genetic information is organized and he was already there postulating and uh, kind of um, uh, not really proposing it, but more about postulating that there might be a 1D code of information uh, that is uh, that will be somehow uh, communicated um, uh, further down uh, in biological processes. And it was actually these lectures that uh, contributed also to the uh, inspiration of um, Watson and Crick, who then a decade later discovered the structure of the DNA molecule itself, so the double helix with uh, 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 instrumental contributions from Rosalind Franklin with her data where the, the, the DNA helix, the double helix as such, was, uh, was revealed. Now, what we are learning here in this, uh, in this state, right, at this point, was already, it started to be known that DNA as, as, a, as a long polymer um, contains or is a built of um, a basis or base pairs, right? So it has building units. And there are for DNA, that there are four um, types of them. And that the, the, the order of your units, of your monomers, so of your phases, gives you a sequence, right? And it's the sequence that encodes, that carries the information. So that was the, um, the big thing here. The sequence carries carries information forward, forward. So, so you have it basically physically encoded in the molecule. So this has then, once, once this has been established, that has led to further big um, the discovery or paradigm shift actually in, um, in biology. And that was then when in 57, James Watson has uh, um, established based on this knowledge the central dogma of molecular biology and that is something that is uh, for us physicists actually extremely interesting and important to, to, to realize right it's this uh, kind of a general rules of flow of information in biological system and what do I 
what do I mean by that? Is that it has been here established that the the information is encoded in the DNA molecule in the in its sequence, yet for the uh, for, for for this information to be carried out and realized in living cells, right? There is a well defined order how this uh, information is first transcribed into RNA, right? So so this process here is called transcription, which has its own alphabet, very similar to this, but one of the bases is actually very unique to, to RNA itself. And then furthermore, in order to, uh, tra to, to translate this information into the uh, molecular machinery itself, which is generally in cell uh, carried out by a protein, uh, this has to be uh, this information is translated in process called translation into a new alphabet into amino acids that are then building the, the protein of interest then and the protein has a certain function or uh, participates in a certain process of cell. So what is interesting is that this here, um, so the, the, this flow from DNA to RNA to protein is very, it's basically the common denominator for, for all uh, living things. This is how the information is encoded and how it uh, uh, basically, how the central dogma impacts actually all cellular processes because any cellular process will need to, to be carried out, will need its protein machinery and for that, the, this, this machinery, in order to be made, the information for that needs to be read out from DNA. So this is kind of the big picture motivation. Why do we actually even care? And before I jump into the physics of it, I want to introduce just a couple of uh, um, terms, which I will be throwing around the left and right, and they might sound very similar um, and confusing. So I have already here now established um, that DNA is a long polymer, which I, for the sake of simplicity, will be um, approximating here double helix with a straight line. <laughs> um, and as I said, uh, it will, it has a sequence. So it has uh, this base pairs, uh, there's a pair to it, to the other side, that actually, that propagates here, that defines as this, this linear information, the 1D info. So this is a 1DNA molecule. This 1DNA molecule is called chromosome. Now, as you know, you have all heard about genes. Genes are actually parts, are, are partial sequences. So for example, here, this would be that this would be a sequence that would identify a gene and a gene is a sequence that codes specifically for a functional unit so it's a it's a wholesome information for a protein so in first approximation, um, you can you can assume right, that uh, basically your your chromosome consists of many uh, many these uh, different sequences that encode for different genes. There are of course for biologists here in the audience, there are of course parts of DNA also that are non-coding, but it, here we will neglect this here in this picture. So that means when you look at it, you have uh, the the number of genes in the DNA, so in a chromosome, is smaller than the number of base pairs, so as the length of uh, your sequence. So that's what's, what's important to note. Now, where do we get from, from chromosomes, so meaning from a uh, single, so one DNA molecule, of, uh, uh, from single DNA, how do we get to genome? Well, as you know, so for example, as humans, we have uh, 23 pairs of uh, DNA molecules, of linear DNA molecules. So you can imagine now 46 of this, um, of these polymers. And all together, all together, this constitutes the entire uh, genetic information 
that is then referred to as genome. So the genome is the entirety of this uh, uh, chromosome is uh, one single DNA molecule, or as we now, let's transfer now to the um, polymer physics nomenclature. So to chromosome, we will be now uh, referring actually as one single polymer, and genome will be our polymer solution, and uh, the uh, gene for functionally, our monomer will be gene. Structurally, our monomer is a base pair, right? So it will depend in which context you can refer to monomer, either this guy or as a, or a single letter. So, okay, so with this, we have established, we have established this. So now, of course, uh, it is biology, so it would be too simple if I could uh, here now uh, simplify the genome with these three terms. So I will give you one more. Oh, let's, let's pause for a minute just to see if there's any questions. Sure. Alexander? Yes. Hi, this is Michael. So hey, you, Michael. Do you include uh, proteins in, in the definition of chromosome or just DNA? Because uh, like histones are a part of chromosome? I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting there. So, so this is uh, now purely just to identify the entities. So this is already chromosome physicist is asking. So this is, this is for astrophysicist, Michael. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so, so let me, along the same lines, Alexander, this is Tom Bishop. Uh, yes. These are 23 polymers that are separate individuals. They're not identical, right? No, no, no. So, so those are yeah. actually it's 23 pairs. So this will be chromosome one, chromosome right. two, chromosome three, and you have two of each. So, okay. so how important is that? We will get to that. Mm. Right now, we're just establishing the system. So if... Uh, but uh, it's both very interesting physically and biologically. Biologically, obviously, uh, you can think about it every gene since it carries information for a unique protein. So in other words, you can, you know, one is for our eye color, the other one for our hair color, the next one for our height and so on. So there are dif different, different processes and different uh, right, uh, hallmarks that are connected. Uh, with these things. So, so different uh, molecular machineries uh, are encoded and meaning different chromosomes actually carry um, different uh, information. So the information that's on chromosome one is different than on chromosome three. That's what I think Tom was uh, pointing towards. Yes, and, and they differ in size to even just purely physical properties. Yes, yes, yes. So this is uh, right now purely we have, uh, we have a solution of 46 uh, linear polymers sitting inside of a confinement, which is our nucleus. So the, the, the more to come. And each pair is identical. Each, each, each one in a pair is, is identical to each. And there are 23 separate lengths, but each one is repeated twice. Yes, one copy from mom, one from dad. And they're identical or they're almost identical? They're identical in the order of the genes, but the genes themselves, basically their realization might be different, right? So this is easiest to describe phenomenologically, meaning you can get information about the gene for color of your eye from a mom having blue eyes, from dad having brown eyes. So you will get actually the, the information, right, for the same gene, but twice. And they typically sit nearby or they can be far apart? That is a very good question. So I don't think that on that the field is uh, actually unified. So there are certainly situations where you will find both. Um, for example, shortly right after, uh, you know, in, in, in cell cycle, shortly after uh, S phase, after the replication part, you will find obviously the copy in the next neighborhood. However, if you wait after mitosis, there are, they generally actually tend to get mixed and uh, be inside of nucleus. There are these historically, right? I mean, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking about these this, uh, radial models uh, of the arrangement of, uh, of uh, chromosomes in the nucleus. Um, there are, I would say, examples for, for, 
for any cases, but there's no order to them. Okay, I think you should go ahead, Alexandra. Yes. So, so we have now our polymer system. And now, as I said, and uh, I think Michael asked me before, it actually, it is not so simple. So I made it beautifully physically simple because as physicists, we like spherical cows, and this uh, system is very uh, detailed, dirty, and with um, enormous uh, number of molecule players. So here, this is the DNA molecule, and as you see, in reality, inside of the cell nucleus, so this purple thing is the nucleus, it is actually, the DNA is not naked in the nucleus, but it actually is complex with these uh, protein particles, which we call, which are made of histone proteins, and together with that wrap around, of DNA around it, form so-called nucleosome particle. So basically, long story short, so the biological detail are for us here from the big picture, not, uh, not uh, critical. We just want to show that now my linear polymer that I have kind of this type of picture, where I have here my, my kind of my beads on a string situation. And I have grown something, what was originally the DNA was two nanometers in diameter. Now I have grown it to a fiber that is now 10, 11 nanometers in, in diameter. So this is now the fiber that you have inside of the nucleus. And for example, over past um, 50 years, there has been a lot of discussion in the field how further this um, fiber is being um, uh, structured and packed. I will, I will avoid here the, this discussion. I, I will move, move here to, to another point. So, so this is what I want to show. This is the chromatin fiber. So now, from now on, when we will be speaking about polymers, we will already refer to polymer to this chromatin fiber, meaning my DNA with protein uh, particles on it. So now, as I told you, we have established that in this nucleus here, so in this thing here, we have inside now 46 uh, linear polymers or 46 spaghetti as they are depicted here in this image. So what would you expect? How would these things actually look? How would such a solution of 46 uh, polymers in thermodynamic equilibrium, how would you expect that they would look? Well, in thermodynamic equilibrium, if I take, right, uh, if I take different polymers so here those are my three um three linear polymers and i decide them to put them into confinement so what will they do they will of course they will seek the maximum entropy and i will i would be getting should they be colored i will be getting this colorful mess what we see in contrast what we see so so here we're maximizing entropy what we are seeing in contrast in the, a living uh, cell nucleus, you will find that these guys actually, every polymer likes to sit on, their, on its own and does not like to mingle with its friends. So this is very interesting. So you see we have here uh, polymers that, uh, th that do not mix. There are, again, from polymer physics perspective, there are different reasons for that, uh, why that could be. I will show you uh, later the, the one part that I will be discussing. This system actually is not in thermodynamic equilibrium, and it's out of equilibrium properties. For example, um, prevent, is, uh, prevent it uh, from, from mixing. This is actually something that was a huge, um, huge progress and a huge step, a huge advance in our field. And from now on, kind of all things that I will be summarizing and showing you uh, in order to illustrate kind of the cutting edge questions that our program is illustrating, everything what I'm showing you is our results and knowledge from past maybe 10, 15 years. So already the fact that these uh, polymers are here demixed uh, inside of the nucleus is knowledge only about 15 years old and was discovered um, and proven kind of by two methods independently. Once is here this on the left that you see the fish, the fluorescent in situ hybridization, where you can in a sequence specific way generate fluorescent probes that allow you to fluorescently label 
um, specific sequences in your in your nucleus. So meaning what has happened here, this here is the nucleus, right? And these the colorful dumplings, each dumpling is one polymer. So meaning when you are looking here at this blue guy, so if this is uh, number 16, so since we know the sequence of the number 16, you will make your fluorescent probes a blue ones that only bind specifically to the sequence of this guy and they will lit up uh, this uh, polymer in blue. So when you do this sequence specific staining, you will see this beautiful separation of these chromosomes and uh, uh, how, they, how they occupy different parts. This was later also confirmed by another beautiful method, which is a biochemical assay called chromosome conformation capture, developed by your Becker and collaborators. And that's a, that's a biochemical assay that allows you actually to measure, I will not go here to the, to the details of the method, but long story short, it allows you to measure the probabilities of certain sequences being in physical proximity with other sequences. So as an example, Example I'm showing here, this is a linear sequence of chromosome 14, and what is plotted here, so this is a sequence of 14 here, sequence here, and what this map shows you are the probabilities that this uh, sequence, uh, this ha sequence is a uh, uh, physical neighbor of this sequence. So this is what these high C maps um, mean. Um, those uh, are basically contact probability maps, they have this, this checkerboard patterns, and of course on the diagonal, that's the basically uh, each part meeting, um, meeting itself. So from this, uh, from, from this approach, which is approach over a population of nuclei versus the fish approach, which is approach on, on single nucleus, you see from both of these, we have had this, this beautiful information that actually these um, polymers uh, do not uh, do not mix but occupy these single territories. Moreover, the um, beautiful information from the chromosome conformation capture techniques has shown that the way how the genome actually falls in 3D, because from these probability maps here, you can now basically reconstruct, you can model what type of uh, polymer folding would correspond to these type of probabilities. And uh, so here, for example, it has been shown that it is uh, consistent with uh, uh, contact maps of a fractal globule. So with that, the genome was uh, here experimentally shown to behave as a fractal. It is, of course, much, much more uh, complex and interesting. Uh, within this fractal structure, you have this enormous details and layers of different structures. So I did not want to hear to draw it myself, so that's why I took this beautiful image uh, from a recent review where you see that between this first uh, level that I showed you between the DNA molecule and the last level that I have showed you, so these, these uh, chromosome territories, so single polymers sitting uh, uh, on their own, there's a lot of in-between organization that is very hierarchical uh, that we were able to learn from these uh, chromosome conformation maps, so from these uh, contact probability maps. And uh, I will not go here into detail what this means uh, and so, but they are, there are beautiful uh, ways how presently a number of groups is uh, connecting these uh, different structural features with function. And so here we are learning kind of the connection between the structure and function of genome. As you have, for example, here, you might have heard, uh, has been recently a big uh, word like topologically associated domains. Those are the, these these local, locally associated areas, or then here we have epigenomic compartments on a larger scale that actually group predominantly active or inactive genes and so, so on. So I will not go here into detail, just want to tell you that there is a, there is a, a number of layers um, in between that we are all trying to understand. Now, in addition, when you look uh, now as a physicist at, uh, at this uh, polymer, in addition to this uh, structure, obviously this uh, polymer has actually very unique um, physical properties. What do, I, what do I mean by that? So I have already introduced to you that the DNA consists of uh, this um, different um, bases or base pairs, the double helix, 
Now there are four different kinds of bases. Uh, they chemically slightly differ. Therefore, if you look at a very small scale, when uh, you look locally, you will have actually deviation in uh, mechanical properties. Now these mechanical properties will be kind of uh, a composite uh, property of both the elastic properties of the polymer as such, as well as its electrostatic properties, since DNA is a polyelectrolyte, so meaning it, it's actually highly charged polymer. So you see here, I have, uh, here is a, is a short piece of the DNA double helix uh, written in its uh, chemical form. And you see here on the phosphate backbone, there are all these negative charges sitting there uh, on uh, on the DNA on both on both sides, so so it is highly negatively charged. So now you can imagine when this DNA molecule needs to bend around those protein particles uh, that I have introduced before, uh, the that requires um, not only a lot of energy, but it can be actually very different depending on which of the which of the bases uh, will be locally there. So you could imagine that actually a sequence, so meaning which specific base this will be present when you are wrapping it around one guy, will actually tune the physical properties. And that that is something that is one big and open question currently. Is there a role of sequence, for example, for positioning of these uh, nucleosomes, right? Nucleosome positioning. Is there is there uh, sequence information involved, and is that maybe um, transmitted via the physical properties of the polymer locally? Moreover, there's uh, there is the epigenetic code, so there is additional layer of information that you might have heard about epigenetics over a past decade as well. So there is a further way how you can um, do certain chemical changes to both these uh, polymer uh, protein particles as well as actually to the DNA molecule itself. And these, so for example, to, to be correct, these, these particles, the nucleosomes are a little bit hairy and you can do various chemical changes on these hairs here where you can encode further layer of information. And it is known now that num a lot of biological machinery actually reads out this information from this epigenetic code. This epigenetic code for us as physicists, however, also changes actually the local physical property. So it's, it's, it's very interesting and you see it's very complex. You have this multi layers of information that are contributing here. So now I have showed so far that you have this, uh, this beautiful DNA molecule, you have this uh, um, strange polymer solution that is not mixed. And now you see there is even uh, within these polymers, there is a huge level of organization. There's even more organization when you, when you look here uh, on the nucleus. There are, there are various other structures uh, that are immersed, that are well-defined, that, um, that we are, uh, that, that, that we are basically, the whole field actually currently is, is, is trying to understand. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say here, that one thing that we we'll learn in textbooks in like the first chapter of every cell biology book is that what is the hallmark of life? It is a compartmentalization, right? So within a cell inside of nucleus, nucleus is a compartment. Now the nucleus has found its further way to compartmentalize, and that's without membranes. So this is a beautiful example of organization without physical boundaries. What do I mean by that? I have just drawn here some lines that looks like, oh, I do have their boundaries. Well, the interesting thing is that what we what the field has been learning over past on only a decade is that organization happens here uh, via a number of different types of phase separations so one well, example of uh, phase separation that uh, here uh, helps to organize the nucleus is for example the liquid liquid phase separation so liquid liquid phase separation has been introduced by by uh, Cliff Brangwin and Tony Hyman about uh, 11 years ago. And it's this beautiful concept showing us here uh, that, the, that, that in the nucleus, when you would have, uh, let's just say, you would have two components, 
Oh, this is easy. So this is uh, very difficult here to change colors. So imagine you would have at the beginning, you would have a mixture of two different components. This is supposed to illustrate a mixture. Sorry about my uh, drawing skill here on the fly. So now what will happen here if these two liquid components actually can beautifully, uh, you, they, they can, well, this, this is from, from this mixture, this is uh, difficult. They can phase separate suddenly into, into these, something that we call, that we call liquid condensates. And so, so, so this is something that we have been in our program now discussing for actually a couple of weeks now. Uh, how can we, um, how can we distinguish are these um, no, equilibrium, non-equilibrium, very likely non-equilibrium we discussed, uh, we discussed in great detail. Um, is this um, uh, macrophase, what, what is the scale of this uh, separation? Does the system want to uh, achieve the complete macrophase separation and completely demix? Or actually, does it want to keep this certain length scale of these um, of these liquid condensates? So those are all the questions that we're that we're currently working on. And here, so the example that I'm showing here specifically would be a uh, uh, organelle or structure that is called nucleolus that I'm showing you here. Example of that is a place where the ribosomes are being made and uh, uh, that th this is a larger structure that actually does behave as a liquid droplet in the nucleus and it forms by phase separating by liquid liquid phase separation from the nucleoplasm so meaning from the solution in in the nucleus and it forms it is even actually even more beautifully uh, complex it actually has a nucleation site directly on the polymer, so it cannot form a nucleate at any random place. It has to be at a specific sequence, and um, that's, uh, uh, that, that, leads, that leads to this phase separation. Interestingly, for those of you uh, the studying phase separation here, the question that, achieve, uh, that uh, kind of arises is, uh, go, can it ever actually achieve a complete demixing. One thing that you have here, an issue in a living system, is that there is a cell cycle, so there is a lifespan. So interestingly, during a lifespan of a living cell, these guys cannot completely phase separate, but are actually held in a certain uh, length scale, which we do not know, is it, uh, is it given by the properties of the system, or is it um, given by some other uh, by some other non-equilibrium uh, property? Another uh, another type of phase separation currently um, hugely discussed in our program uh, that leads to organization of the nucleus is the microphase separation, specifically of the of the chromatin fiber, where now over, you can imagine as I was drawing you the polymers, right? You can imagine uh, that the DNA with all these changes that I have, that this very local variations that I have mentioned with uh, either epigenetic marks uh, or so can lead to the fact that you can actually build yourself a copolymer, right? Um, so that means if you have now, for example, such, such a copolymer and uh, depending on the interactions, of these uh, single subunits. So here, for example, here in this uh, in this uh, uh, table, there would be a uh, an overview of interactions between three different components. So I have drawn here too. So you can imagine we can have we can define our interactions A A A B and B B. And uh, let's just say the the B B uh, is uh, is very uh, they're very self attractive. So what you what you can see that you will you will achieve you will achieve this type of local phase separation right so so you will have this this uh this microphase phase separation where uh well i don't want to miss it now with, with a further color uh but you see that this is now what happens when you have a polymer now uh, inside so in, inside of the of confinement so you can imagine now in the nucleus here in 
So th this is difficult because you don't see where I'm pointing. So, uh, and it takes all time between changing all these tools. So I will try here, when you look here inside of this nucleus, so you see here different different polymers will, with their different blocks. So here, this would be a tri-block. And you see how this here has beautifully face separated. You have here the, the blue guys coming together. Actually, even the red guys are having tendencies to come together. And this here, when you simulate a long chain, you will see that you will achieve a, such a um, simulation result, which is actually very interesting because this is in a beautiful um, agreement uh, when you compare to um, the nuclei in living cells where basically these uh, specific uh, types of three types of monomers would be also here colored into these uh, three categories. Uh, Alexandra, let's take yes. a quick pause and yes. see if there's any questions. Yes, you have to yell the questions at me because I am uh, looking at my iPad and I do not yeah. see my screen. I cannot look at both. And that's, that's why I'm pausing for a moment. <laughs> Yeah, please just, I see one raised hand from Tetsuya, please just. Okay, I have a question about the epigenetics that makes A and B. Uh, how much extent the epigenetic marks is dynamic in the sense that there are uh, acetyl transferase or methyl transferase that changes the epigenetic marks while epigenetic inheritance must be achieved? Can you please repeat the question? I'm like, I understood only every second word. Uh, how much extent the epigenetic marks are dynamic? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I don't think that the uh, physicists here, so, so let, me, <laughs> let me explain the question for our KTP audience, for non-biologists. Uh, uh, so by these epigenetic marks, right? So, so this would be kind of my definition of these uh, monomers A and B that I have defined. So those would be defined by this by epigenetics. And so what Petsuya is asking, how stable are they? So they, can they be actually changing within the rate in a short time that suddenly my B becomes A and my A becomes B and so on. So, so for this, in this, so, so those are two separate questions if you look at it physically or biologically. So in this model, I don't think that uh, they are changing uh, the, uh, the, the kind, the nature of the world, they are stable. So basically, the, the length, the time scale here is infinite compared to the time of simulation. In reality, this is a very interesting question, and this is, I think, uh, of, so so there there is not, it's not completely understood, but there are there are epigenetic marks of both kinds. There are such that are even inherited and of, are basically going to go with you through the cell cycle, but there are such that can be actually on certain time scale changed. And so, so, for example, change between heterochromatin and euchromatin, if that's what you're asking, uh, right, that you can have the constitutive and facultative part. So basically things that can be, in theory, reactivated, and then you also have things that are, that are not activable at the time scale of the cell cycle. But this is, I believe, this is too biological for, for our physics audience here. Is that yeah, let me let me ask a different question. When you talked about uh, one slide back, liquid liquid phase yes. separation, um, it, can you give us a sense of the time scale? That implies some march of time. I yes. Presume, but I, so this is uh, that, that's that's very 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 interesting. So um, the for example, so in my lab we have specifically looked here at the at the fusion of these uh, droplets uh, inside of human cells. So it takes uh, it. It takes a good couple of hours for them actually to become a final new round droplet. It is basically this 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 neck that uh, for when you have this hourglass shape, this thin neck um, is formed for about 10-15 minutes. So it, it is rather slow. It is uh, it is rather slow, right? But that's uh, that's for this specific process. That's not to say that there cannot be uh, other processes. Uh, that would be that would be far faster. I'm showing only one example nucleus that is um, that is well studied. What is very interesting is that you have uh, several or actually numerous different types of these liquid condensates phase separating simultaneously. So I have only drawn it, drawn it here as a yellow and blue 
in reality, imagine there will there would be many colors. And you would have basically you would face separate droplet for this type of function, droplet for that type of function, droplet. So so that's so interesting that we see that there is very many this 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 local weakly interacting uh, aggregates that behave as uh, liquid uh, liquid like. That's why we like to call them currently presently the name is liquid condensate in the field. Great, thank you. So maybe just a few more few maybe five more minutes, Alexandra. Sure, 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 sure. Can I so, ask a yeah. Can I, I, sorry to interrupt, but I, I'm finding this absolutely fascinating uh, because it looks very much like things that I've been doing recently in a completely different field. I guess my question boils down to this. You're seeing this phase separation between these different kinds of, uh, of, of DNA, of different parts of DNA molecules. Do you really know what function that serves? And let me just tell you the, the, why I'm, I'm curious is, is that I, I've been working and, and I've become an absolute heretic because for almost a century, people have been looking at solids and looking at dislocations, which are line defects, and they move around inside and they see them uh, forming clumps. And, so, and, and, and But they never had a good theory of what was going on, uh, and uh, which has driven me right up the wall. Uh, but as it turns out, it's absolutely true, I think, that the, 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 those, the, the clumps that they form on certain occasions serve no purpose whatsoever when you have a decent theory of what's going on. Now, do you have a good theory of why these things are separating and what purpose it serves? So this is a, this is, this is a great uh, topic of discussion in the field. So what we see is that... Uh, most of these liquid condensates that have been so far identified, they do actually have a biological function. So for example, like this uh, red droplet that you see here in my images, that is actually, that has a function, it makes ribosomes. So it has to, it, and it only does its work if, if it fades, separates and makes the droplet. And this is true for a number of these different types of droplets that they are connected with a function. Now, if there is a characteristic length scale that they need to achieve, or if there is, you know, so time scales and length scale, we don't know yet. So this is why we are, you know, we are measuring, we're trying to figure out, uh, we're trying to learn from the kinetics of these processes, what is actually the physical process underlying, for example, the coarsening, right, and uh, basically forming of, uh, of that phase. And that we will hope, uh, we hope that that will inform us what, what it is. But there is definitely connection with the function. For example, this red uh, droplet here, if you, there are ways how you can stop the function, what it does. So there is, imagine there is a drug that you can poison that machinery that works there. Once you do that and that droplet cannot work, it dissolves. It basically, if it cannot do its function, it goes back into solution. It only exists when it's actually, when it's working. And how does it know that? <laughs> well, it's so, 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 that, that's, that's very interesting, right? So, uh, you know, we can only speculate at this moment, but there will be very likely, there will be chemical changes uh, to, you know, with respect to local charges and uh, so, so on, that actually, that activity, is in some way, you know, introducing or removing or whatever. So there will be physical changes or chemical changes that are locally happening via that activity. Just emphasizes how extraordinarily complex this business is. Yes, yes. So that's why. So, so this is actually, it's a, you know, this is uh, interesting that you you are uh, bringing this point out because this is what we've had so far: two beautiful discussions on phase separations. And uh, we have discussed exactly that, that it's so complicated. How to go best about it? Do we go after every single detail or do we zoom out and remain phenomenological and just start basically kind of with that picture, right? So, and this is where kind of biology and physics fields kind of have different philosophies, how to approach uh, these things. So, so it's, it's very exciting. And it's, you know, it's a brand new burgeoning field. So a lot of beautiful questions to, to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, Alexandra, I'll let you let you wrap it up in the next few minutes. All right, so I'll okay, so so I uh, will skip through through the further concepts that I want to show. I will. It, I mean, these phase separations are the super exciting thing that uh, keeps us busy these days in our program. So I will just uh, uh, mention a third type that I will briefly briefly summarize and then jump to kind of overview of our topics. And that's, that, for example, another type of phase separation that uh, well, can happen and is being discussed is also activity-driven phase separation. What can that uh, mean? So you have just finished uh, your program on active matter. So you have heard a beautiful talk uh, from Christina. So uh, you, you might remember that when you have a mixture, for example, of, uh, of active and passive particles, what they will do they will actually phase separate and the 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 active ones right will they they will they will actually group together so uh it's difficult to draw very fast so it's not pretty um so so there is this the, the phase separation now it is very interesting that a similar uh, observation was done also uh, for for polymers so it has been shown that when would you ha if you have a polymer that would have now active active parts, this also can lead actually then to a phase separation of the active parts basically uh, coming together. So this is so so you see we have kind of a competition of a number of uh, various phase separating mechanisms that. Many of them probably will be happening simultaneously in the system since this is a multi-component system where you kind of have uh, many axes and many order parameters to follow. Uh, so, so also different components presently are being viewed kind of separately. So you see the liquid, liquid phase separation is kind of the view of the solvent of the polymer. The microphase separation of the polymer and the activity driven is more now uh, the, the view of what the polymer is doing itself. Now you can imagine you have a solvent and the polymer uh, both uh, undergoing um, different types of phase separation. So, so the situation is very complex. To make it even uh, more complex is that, as I alluded at the beginning, this is a non-equilibrium system. What does it mean? There are these active processes that are exactly present here. So the system dissipates energy uh, and these active processes lead to further emergent properties of the system that the system does not have when it's passive. And so uh, with, with that, um, actually, I will just uh, end up on basically one emergent property that I would like to, I would like to show is uh, that, for example, um, when you observe a motion uh, of the polymer inside of the nucleus, you, you will find, so what we have found a few years ago is that actually the polymer uh, moves coherently over microns and seconds when it's healthy and active. When you deplete the activity, you remove basically its, its non-equilibrium nature, you leave just passive polymer, it will just uh, undergo Brownian dynamics. So it will be only, um, there, there will be no correlation. So you see, so this is kind of the, uh, an example of emergent uh, property due to activity. So with that, I will, I will skip my uh, other, well, a couple more concepts that I wanted to introduce, but just give you kind of an overview of what are all the topics that are presently discussed and worked on in our program. So we are uh, discussing the, the organization of the nucleus via phase separations that I saw here also woke up the, the, the most uh, interest. We are also, we have discussed the 3D and 4D organization of the genome inside the nucleus. Uh, now you can imagine as I, told you there is all this activity, meaning, and I also explained to you that there's this complex hierarchical structure, but if there's activity and there's a motion, how does that structure actually change in time? So now we need to actually understand that in 3D and 4D, 
then of course uh, their polymer physics proves here enormously useful as we can learn different uh, properties of the system from different type of approaches uh, loops specifically in these models uh, have been uh, a huge uh, um, highlight since it has been shown both uh, basically from experiments and in in uh, uh, simulations that you know if you are packing this enormously long polymer into this fractal like structure uh, Go, the, it is very effective actually to locally generate loops to help you to do so. This allows you to avoid nothing, which you can imagine you don't want your genome to have knots necessarily, even though your cell actually has a machinery even to resolve knots. So knots and entanglements is another topic that we have been dealing with. And the structural maintenance of chromosomes, so this is how these cells are forming and keeping these loops. We have also discussed here the genome mechanics uh, we've discussed, for example, this morning. So this is exactly that part, as I was telling you, that the uh, are the mechanical properties actually a function of the sequence uh, locally and how does that matter. And uh, moreover, we have also touched upon the effect of DNA damage. So this is something that all of us, and especially you guys uh, in Santa Barbara, and you walk in the sun, every uh, time when you walk on the sun, there are photons that are actually causing uh, damage to DNA molecules uh, in uh, skin cells. And so th this damage can, can, can vary um, for, at the different levels, but it's very interesting how that actually then impacts the, the local organization of the polymer and the changes in dynamics and so on. And so that actually can teach us also a lot about our system. So yes, and finally, of course, the structure versus function that's the that's the holy grail so we want to understand what is it what is it good for so with that thank you very much and i'm happy to take um any more questions great thank you alexandra thank, thank you. you thank you i hear the applause <laughs> okay other questions especially from non Chromosome program participants. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, I understand this is heavy biology, but I tried to extract the biology and make it uh, polymers purely. <laughs> and Good job. So I guess out of curiosity, and just to keep it just a little bit alive, you mentioned that, that there was a drug that would then cause disassembly of the of, of your red blobs. Um, was it understood that that's what the drug did, or or was it discovered later that that was the drug's impact? No, no. So so it's actually so it's. Uh, uh, it was specifically an uh, approach that was developed kind of uh, for understanding why does this droplet nucleate at a specific sequence. Mm -hmm. So they were basically messing with that sequence and they had a different way how to perturb it. They even had a way how to, for example, you take that sequence and you copy it somewhere else into polymer. Will you make a droplet there? Yes, you will. But, <laughs> right, and if you damage that sequence or you do something to it, the droplet uh, does, does, does not form. Right. So, yeah, so it is very smart. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much, Alexandra. Uh, just for all of you.